Let's go back to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, if you will, please. This time, I kind of, I don't, kind of zeroing in, I guess. Like I say, it's, it's uh, normally what the Lord leads me to do is take one of the highlights from our morning message and drill down deeper and uh, make it uh, more a focal point. And so this is what I want to do. Remember verse 17, 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 17. Look at it, if you will. Um, In a moment, we'll read it together. But I was wondering if I could assign uh, some verses for you to read from the congregation when I get to them. Um, Brother Pedro, 1 Thessalonians, I mean, 1 Corinthians 1, 7, please. Um, Brother, uh, Pastor Dan, 1 Corinthians 16, 22, please. Uh, Brother Lyndon, uh, Philippians 3.20, please. Uh, Fred, you want, uh, Brother Fred, you want to read Philippians 4.5, chapter 4, verse 5. Um, Gabe, 1 Thessalonians 1, verse 10. Um, Titus 2.13, volunteers from here on out. Titus 2.13, he'll do that. Okay, our sister Trina, Titus 2.13. James 5.8, who'll do that? Okay, our sister Christine, James 5.8. First John 2.28, 1 John chapter 2, verse 28. Okay, our sister Magda will do that. And I saw our sister Linda's hand, Revelation 22. You ready for this? Verse 7, 12, and 20. Three times. Okay. All right, so those are the verses that we'll get to in a moment. But now that you have 1 Thessalonians 4 and verse 17 open, let's just read it together, okay? And perhaps you can quote it because this was one of our memory verses. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together to meet them in the clouds. Is that how it goes? And to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Okay. So we're going to be talking about the rapture. As I said, look at looking at it a little more closely. Now, listen to me very carefully, because I do not recommend this. But if you get your Bible knowledge and your theology off of YouTube videos and internet sermons, it seems to be a current fad to be biased against the view that believers are going to be raptured from the earth to be with the Lord before the tribulation period. There is some debate, obviously, about the time of the rapture. Look, there are some, and I believe, true Christians who don't even believe in a rapture. But those that do believe in the rapture of the church, there is some debate about the timing of the rapture. That is, the timing of the rapture is implied in the Bible, but it's not explicit. It's not explicitly stated that the rapture is going to take place at this time. I believe that it's explicit that there will be a rapture. I mean, what do you do with verse 17 that we've just read? That believers are going to be caught up. Remember I said the Latin word, rapturo, is this phrase caught up. And it means to seize and to carry away. The word rapture isn't in the Bible. But as I said this morning, the Latin Vulgate version uh, was the Bible version that was available to the masses for a thousand years. So that had some influence. And uh, so the actual word in the original Greek language here in verse 17 is, is the word harpazo. And it means to quickly and suddenly snatch away, caught up, snatch away, even to seize by force. 
and to snatch away. It's used uh, uh, in the New Testament in other passages. By the way, weren't there other believers that were raptured already? I can think of a couple. Mm -hmm. I mean, again, obviously that guy in Genesis chapter 5, what's his name? Enoch. Enoch. It's implied that he was raptured. It's not stated. It just says, one day he was not, for God took him. There's another guy, a prophet in the Old Testament, that we could say was raptured. You remember his name? Elijah. He was taken up and was seen by his uh, replacement, Elisha, as being taken up by the Lord in a fiery chariot, right? Well, that was a rapture. He didn't die, and Enoch didn't die. And there is coming a day when believers in Jesus that are a part of the, the New Testament church the Bible talks about that will be caught up like Elijah was or like Enoch was, that is, they will be taken by the Lord without having to pass, as we sang, through the veil, through the valley of the shadow of death. Okay? But as I said, there are different views as to the timing of this rapture. And there are three major opinions pertaining to the timing of the rapture. Three viewpoints. I'm going to name them and I'm going to just give a little more uh, detail about them. There is the opinion that the rapture is before the tribulation before that seven-year period called in Daniel 9, the 70th week of Daniel. People that believe in a rapture before the tribulation, are uh, they believe in a pre-tribulation rapture. That makes sense, right? Before. Pre means before. Pre-tribulation rapture. Then there are believers that believe in a rapture that think that, no, it's not going to be before the tribulation but they understand it as taking place somewhere in the middle of the tribulation. And so they are called mid, mid rapturists, I guess you'd say, or mid trib rapturists. And then there's a third main viewpoint, and that is people that believe that the rapture is going to take place after the tribulation. After is post. And so they are called post-tribulationists because they believe that there be a rapture, but it's after that 70th week of Daniel. So let's look at each one of them real briefly. Pre-tribulation rapturists, if I could put it that way. By the way, in my opinion, that's the correct view, okay? But it's, it, you know, if I'm wrong, I won't go to hell. <laughs> Or if uh, they're wrong, it's not going to affect their salvation. But the pre-tribulation rapture, as I said, is that position that we believe that Jesus will rapture the church before the 70th week of Daniel, before that seven-year tribulation period. And as a result... Here's the good news. If you believe in a pre-tribulation rapture, then you know that believers will not go through any part of the tribulation because they won't be here. They won't be here on this earth. They will be, as the scripture says in verse 17, they'll meet the Lord in the air, and so shall they ever be with the Lord. And that is comfort in verse 18. So... God will take them out of here before, can I put it this way, all hell breaks loose on this earth in what is called the 70th week of Daniel and what the last three and a half years is called the time of Jacob's trouble. They'll be gone. That's what the pre-tribulationists believe. But also, if, as a pre-tribulation rapturist, I believe that the Bible teaches that after that seven-year period of tribulation, 
after the tribulation, then there will be the glorious second coming of uh, Jesus the Messiah, and that those that were raptured will come back with him and remain with him as he establishes his kingdom and reigns on this earth with him for a thousand years. Okay? We'll have a Q&A time afterwards. Second position, the mid-tribulation rapturous position. And by the way, I should get a couple of guys if you want to give each one a, a copy of that that wants one. Yeah, yeah, you can do that while I'm going over this. The mid-tribulation uh, belief is that the church will be raptured from this earth in the middle of that seven-year tribulation or seventh week of Daniel. That is at the three and a half year point or half at the halfway point. Because, and here's why they hold to that, because they interpret the last three and a half years to be the exact time when God pours out his wrath upon this earth. And they believe correctly, as 1 Thessalonians 5, 9 says, God hath not appointed us to wrath. So they say God's going to take his church out of here at the midpoint before what they say, he pours out his wrath. And they believe church isn't subject to the wrath of God. Of course, I think God's wrath is going to be poured out during the whole seven years in one way or another. Here's the final viewpoint of the three major ones, what we call post-tribulationists. That is, People that are believers that think that the church will remain on earth throughout the entire seven-year tribulation period, throughout the entire 70th week of Daniel, and that they will be raptured immediately after when Jesus comes in his glorious second coming. They are post-tribulationists. Okay, hopefully I haven't confused you. Pre, mid, and post. Okay? That makes sense. Now, as I said, I'm convinced that the Bible teaches a pre-tribulation rapture. Why is that significant? This is what I want to spend the rest of our time on. I mean, why does that matter? Whether it be pre, mid, or post, so what? In fact, I've heard some say, oh, I'm not uh, pre, mid, or post. I'm a pro-rapturist. I'm for it. Or I'm a pan-rapturist. And by that they mean it's all going to pan out anyway. <laughs> I'm not going to take a position. Well, what does it matter? I mean, it doesn't affect a person's salvation. Okay? It doesn't affect a person being saved or not. So what's the difference as to the position you take? Well, I think it's important that you take the position of a pre-trib rapture for at least three reasons. I don't have time to go through them all, but at least three reasons. What you're getting right now is a handout that I put together to distinguish between the rapture and the second coming. In a moment, I'm going to address this, but I would just simply say this. Some have explained it this way, that the second coming of Christ is in two phases. The rapture is the first phase, and the glorious second, com second coming is the second phase. And one clear way to distinguish the two comings is that in the rapture, he doesn't come to earth. He stays in the air, and those believers on earth joined him there in the air. But in his glorious second coming, it's very clear, he comes to earth, and when he puts his feet on the earth, the whole topography of the Middle East changes, especially Israel. That's what Zechariah 14 teaches. 
So in the rapture, he doesn't come to earth. In the second coming, he comes to earth. So some people just say, okay, the return of Christ is in two phases, the rapture and the second coming. I, I gave you that sheet so you can compare and see that they're not the same. Because if you don't know this difference, you're going to mix up the second coming with the rapture. And if you mix up the second coming with the rapture, uh, Israel gets all messed up. And the fact of the matter is, it is a correct understanding of Israelology, if I can use that term, that really gives you a an acumen a, and, and an accuracy as to Bible prophecy. If you X Israel out of the picture, you're going to be all messed up. And uh, so Bible clearly distinguishes between the nation of Israel and the church. Remember what Paul said? Uh, in Corinthians, he said, don't give offense to the Jew, to the Gentile, nor to the church of God. <laughs> Distinct entities, okay? So anyway, that's not my point. My point is this. Why is it important that you become a pre-tribulation rapturist? Why is that? Well, the first main reason, I'm just going to share three, is what I call imminency. Imminency. And here we go back to the Latin again. The, the word imminent is from the Latin originally, uh, iminio, iminiere. It means to overhang or to hang over one's head. So an imminent event is something that is always hanging overhead, something that thus could happen at any moment. If, some, if, if an event is imminent, other things may happen before the imminent event takes place, but it, nothing else must happen. You get that? Hope I'm not confusing you. Stick with me. It'll be as clear as mud by the time we're all done. <laughs> the reason that this is important imminency is important is because the other rapture views, guess what they do? They teach that at least some part of the tribulation must happen before Christ can rapture the church, and that completely destroys the teaching of imminency. You say, well, why is imminency of Jesus' rapture of the church important? I think it can be demonstrated that the entire New Testament church held vigorously to Jesus coming back at any time. Let's illustrate it. 1 Corinthians 1 7. Waiting for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. All right. How about uh, 1 Corinthians 16, 22? If any man love not the Lord Jesus Christ, let him be anathema, Maranatha. Okay, you know what Maranatha, tell them what Maranatha means. The Lord comes. The Lord comes. Present tense. All right. Next one, Philippians 3.20. Okay, we look for the Savior. We don't look for signs that have to be fulfilled. We look for the Savior, and it's talking about his return. All right? Chapter 4, Philippians, verse 5. Let your moderation be known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. The Lord is at hand. In other words, he can come any moment. All right? Uh, 1 Thessalonians 1.10, nice and loud. And the wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath to come. Okay, and wait for his son from heaven, waiting for Jesus to return. Titus 2.13. We're looking, again, not for signs, 
But for the blessed hope, what is that? The glorious appearing of our great God, our Savior Jesus. James 5, 8. Be also patient. Establish your hearts for the coming of the Lord. The coming of the Lord, it's dear. It draws nigh. First John 2, 28. And now, little children, abide in him, that when he shall appear, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. Okay. He says, live right, basically. Live pure, so that when Jesus comes, you won't be ashamed at his coming. You got to always be ready is basically what that verse is saying because Jesus could come at any time. Revelation 22, verses 7, 12, and 20. Behold, I come quickly. Blessed is he that keepeth the sayings of the prophecy of this book. Verse 12. And behold, I come quickly. And my reward is with me to give every man according as his work shall be. Verse 20. He which testifieth these things shall saith, Surely I come quickly. Amen. Oh. Even so come, Lord Jesus. Okay, even so come, Lord Jesus. All right. And, and again, that is not an exhaustive list of New Testament scriptures that... Uh, imply the fact that Jesus can come back at any moment, that his coming is imminent. But that's enough to get us started. That's enough to nail it down to prove the fact that Jesus doesn't have to have anything else happen to appear. We have to be ready. So the, the, the demand that this puts on us is that uh, the time of the return or the rapture is uncertain. There's no specific time that has to expire before the rapture. No one can legitimately set a date for the rapture, although many through church history have done that. You can't say, really, you can't even say that Jesus is coming soon because Emerson, uh, him being imminent in his coming, it just uh, cre it, it it just doesn't allow that. Relative. Yeah, exactly. And so I remember when I was uh, a teenager, there was a a nationwide famous evangelist, and uh, he had a fundraising campaign. Uh, he was big in prophecy, and so he was. Uh, giving out these little lapel pins and they and they said perhaps today well i can live with that perhaps today meaning perhaps jesus is going to come back today but there's no way of knowing that it's going to be today right that's the importance of imminency and what that demands of us then if we believe in that it creates pressure upon us that will motivate us to live holy lives. If you don't know when Jesus is going to show up, you want to be ready all the time, right? And so it creates pressure and motivates us to want to live holy lives and want to have an aggressive ministry of reaching people. It, it's a cure for apathy, if you really believe this. And uh, it makes a major difference in a believer's values and a believer's actions and their priorities and their goals in life. If Jesus could come back any moment, I need to be ready. So that's the that's the importance and the significance of the imminency of the rapture. Here's a second reason I believe in the pre-tribulation rapture. Go back with me to John chapter 14, if you would, please. John chapter 14. This is the only passage in the Gospels that has to do with the rapture. Now, there, Jesus speaks a lot about the second coming, right? I mean, Matthew 24, Matthew 25, uh, Luke 12, the parallel. He says a lot about the second coming. This is the only reference that Jesus makes to the rapture. 
John chapter 14, and uh, he's about to depart from his disciples. He's going to die. He's going to rise from the dead, and then he's going to ascend to heaven uh, 40 days after the resurrection, and he's going to leave them behind to do the work. So he's trying to prepare them for that. In John 14, 1, he tells them, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. And then here's what he says. Here is the pre-tribulation rapture from the lips of Jesus. In my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place. Now, remember, he's going to rise from the dead. 40 days later, he's going to ascend to heaven. I'm going to go to heaven, basically. And I'm going to prepare a place for you. Why? That where I am, there ye may be also. Okay. The second reason I believe in the significance of a pre-tribulation rapture is not imminency, but intimacy. 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 Why do I use that term? See that, uh, that word in verse 3? I will come again and receive you unto myself. That's the same word that is used in Matthew chapter 1 and uh, verse 20 and verse 24, where the angel tells Jacob to receive Mary as his wife. Why do I bring that up? Because in the future... Jesus is going to come again. He's going to descend from heaven to take the Christians, to take believers, the church, to heaven to dwell with him forever. And here's the picture that he's drawing from. You may not be aware of this, but what he's saying in verse 3 and 4 of John 14 draws upon the Jewish marriage custom of his day. And the disciples would have known this. What he's saying, he's making an analogy. In that day, when a Jewish man and a Jewish woman were to be married, there was a period prior to the wedding called the betrothal. The nearest uh, equivalent, but not the same, is our period of engagement. What happened was this. The young man and his father would make a trip across the town to the home of the young woman that he wanted to claim as his bride, who was living in her with her father and the family in her father's house. And they would get together, the, the, the groom and his father, with the 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 uh, the bride's father and probably her older brother and they would negotiate a bride price a dowry that would be paid in order to uh, have a wife you had to pay for her and the price varied on her social status and and uh, so forth and so you had to negotiate a bride price and when the bride price was negotiated then the covenant would be uh, would be confirmed. That covenant, that betrothal uh, period, that covenant would be confirmed. They would uh, perhaps there would be a sacrificial meal, where maybe an animal would be sacrificed and they eat a covenant meal together. But it always involved a cup, where the the groom. He would take uh, a cup of uh, the fruit of the vine and uh, he would drink it, a sip of it. He would drink a sip of it. And in doing so, he would be saying to her, this cup represents my life and I vow to give my life to you. And then the cup would be offered to her and she would have a say in it. Even though it was an arranged marriage, she could, uh, she could back out. If she took that cup and she also took a sip of it, 
she would be saying, and I do, I give, I vow to give my life to you. Kind of reminds you of the Lord's Supper, doesn't it? I think that's what Jesus had in mind when he was uh, instituting the Lord's Supper. He was basically saying, I love you. I want you to be my bride. So when that was settled, what would happen would be that the father and the groom would leave the, the, uh, the bride and her father's house and they would travel back across the town to their own house. And there would be a period of separation. Usually it was about a year. And it would be the task of that groom to add on living space to his father's house so that he then could, at the end of that year, claim his bride. And they would have a hoopa. They would have a bridal chamber. They would have a place that they would live in the father's house. That's how they did it. it uh, you go to Israel today, like you could go to the, the city of Capernaum and see the, the ruins there. That's the city that Jesus worked out of in his earthly ministry. And in Capernaum, there, there is archaeological uh, dig that shows the insula, the, the setup where it was a family that lived in this house and family members just built on it and around it, around a central courtyard. Well, this is the, the picture that's happening here. At the end of that year period, when the, when the bridal chamber was built, when the, when the insula was, uh, addition was complete, that uh, bridegroom would gather together his groomsmen and there would be a torch lit procession at night across that town, across that village to the house of the bride. And there, were, when they got within earshot, there would be a shout from one of the bride's groom, uh, bridegroom's uh, groomsmen, just uh, acknowledging and announcing that the time has come to claim the bride. And then the bride and her bridesmaids, I guess you would call them, would join that, uh, that, that group and there would be a larger procession that would go back across town to the groom's father's house. And when they got to the groom's father's house and got into the courtyard, that whole courtyard would be lit up and all the wedding guests would be seated waiting for the wedding proper to begin. The bridegroom and his bride would be ushered into that hoopa, into that bridal chamber, into that part that he had built on his father's house. They would physically consummate the marriage, and then they he would come out and announce that they are truly man and wife. They're wedded. And then the feast would begin, and it would last for seven days. Now, I think you've already made some connections in your thinking. This is what Jesus is talking about when he said uh, that uh, in my father's house are many rooms, are many mansions. He's talking about the father's house like an insula, and he's the son, and he's going to go back to his father's house, which is heaven, and he's going to build rooms for his bride, the church. And there's going to come a day when he's going to come back and he's going to claim his bride and he's going to take his bride to his father's house, which is heaven. And Revelation 19, uh, the first eight verses is about a big wedding feast. And the bride is now becoming officially the wife of Jesus. So that's why I'm saying that I believe in the pre-tribulation rapture because of this intimacy that is being mentioned here, that Christ comes after his ascension and that separation period. He returns to take his church, his bride to heaven. There's a wedding feast and only a pre-tribulation rapture corresponds to that analogy that Jesus is using here. Jesus is using the Jewish marriage analogy, and only the pre-trib rapture connects and corresponds to that analogy. Okay? And the third and final 
thing I think is significant to believe in a pre-trib rapture is just prophecy. In 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 15, and by the way, I referenced this in the morning, but in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and uh, in verse uh, 51 and 52, Paul unveils a truth that never was known to people before. It's, it's a truth that God had hidden until this point. I show, him, I show you a mystery. Will not, will not all sleep. That means not all believers will die a physical death. We talked about sleep, what that meant this morning. Will not all die a physical death, but we will all be changed. We'll all be glorified. We'll all eventually have glorified bodies. And we saw the timing of that. It's it's it the, the difference in time between saints that have died before the Lord's return, before the rapture, and saints that are alive at the Lord's rapture. The timing is almost insignificant. It's almost simultaneous because he said it happens in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye. And uh, the, the, the word that Paul uses in this passage to describe that is the word that we get our English word atom from. It happens in an atomic particle of time so quickly. We say a split second, but even shorter than that. So he says, we'll all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye. He says, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we, that is living believers, when Jesus returns, will be changed. We'll have glorified bodies given to us when we are translated to meet him and them in the air. But I want you to note in verse 52, the term, the last trump, the last trump. And I said this morning, and I know this is overlap and repeat, but I want you to, to really understand this. I believe that all of this, the, the seven Jewish feasts have prophetic significance. For instance, Jesus fulfilled four of the feasts already, right? He fulfilled the four spring feasts already. Well, I believe that Jesus will fulfill the last fall feasts too. But you know, there's a period of time between the, the fourth of the spring feast, which is Shavuot or Pentecost, and uh, the, uh, the fall, first fall feast, which the Jews call Rosh Hashanah, but biblically in Leviticus 23, it's the Feast of Trumpets. And there are trumpets that are blown, shofar trumpets that are blown on Rosh Hashanah, right? There is. And so this connects. I believe as Passover was the fulfillment of uh, the redemption, not only of the Jewish people from Egypt, but the redemption of all people from slavery to sin right? And that Pentecost was the birthday of the church. Look at Acts chapter 2. The church is officially formed on the day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit descends. And I think that the Feast of Trumpets, the first fall feast that is called Rosh Hashanah today, I think the Feast of, of Trumpets is the fulfillment of the second coming. Because trumpets are sounded at the rapture, at the glorious appearing of Jesus when he comes to this earth at the end of the tribulation. It's the Feast of Trump. You know, today, when the when Rosh Hashanah is celebrated, there is a series that are that uh, that are uh, of blast blown on the shofar trumpet. There's a there's a, a series of short blasts, and then it ends with uh, uh, a long blast from the shofar called the Tekiah Gorala, and it, and it means the great or the last trump. And Judaism to this day connects this trumpet with the resurrection. 
with the resurrection of the dead. So I believe that the rapture is the fulfillment of uh, trumpets. It is, uh, it's viewing Israel 70 uh, or seven biblical feasts as having prophetic uh, nature. And this is the fulfillment of the second coming. And that long period, we call it summer, right? That long period between Pentecost and, uh, and the Feast of Trumpets prophetically, I think that's the church age that we've been in for almost 2,000 years now. And so when Christ returns, as I said originally, I gave you that sheet to compare the two. When Christ returns, there's two phases. There is the rapture, which is before the tribulation. And then there is the second coming, which is after the tribulation. And both of those together are the f are complete fulfillment of the Feast of Trumpets.